Chris Moss here with the Inside Line podcast. This time round we're teaming up with former BSB champ John Reynolds. The fans' favourite from Nottingham spoke to us about his title-winning 2004 season when he rode for Rizla Suzuki. Turned out to be really enlightening with John telling us lots of stuff including the ups and downs of his year, the importance of teamwork and watching Yuki Kageyama doing a bit of dancing with no clothes on. Hi John, uh, hope you're doing well, though I would imagine like the rest of us, life's a bit different for you now during this lockdown. Yeah, very much so Chris, but you know what, it's the sun shining, the gardens never look better, and uh, <laughs> the, dogs, the dogs never walk so far, so uh, yeah, off that, which is cool. I, I think you may be shattering any rock and roll image punters may have of you. When you're in lockdown, there's nothing else you can do, is there? Uh, I think it's a time for great reflection. And on that note, uh, I'll tell you what I want to do, John, to give us a bit of a sort of an idea of what life is like as a professional racer. I just want to ask you sort of how serious and pressured the life of a leading British superbike contender is. I mean, I'd imagine it's a tough and demanding business. Very much so. I mean, of course, the older you get as well. I mean, I was on that year, I was, uh, I think, 41 uh, coming into the start of the season. Well, of course, you know, I was as fit as I was when I was 20, but I just had to work a lot harder to do it. You know, a lot more training and uh, a lot more bicycling and all that sort of thing. But regarding stress, my dad always said to me, <clears throat> you're only as good as the last race. Well, you know what? You know, you just can't afford to have too many bad weekends, can you? Yeah, I mean, we'll come to those in a bit more detail. But, I mean, does it generally take over your life, John? Is it all consuming? Does nothing else matter? Absolutely, yeah. Right from, you get Christmas out of the way, and then, of course, all the testing starts. Then it really gets serious, and then you just have to knuckle down. And, yes, to be honest with you, you don't think anything else or very little else apart from what the job is in hand, which was to win the British Superbike Championship. And, uh, you know, when you've got a massive team around, you're spending lots and lots of money to get that job done. And it's down to you to do it at the end of the day. You know, you, there's a massive team behind you, of course, and they're all working flat out to do the job. But at the end of the day, I'm sat on the line. Uh, do you know what? I can, I can fit you. You've described it so well, I can feel the bloody pressure now. So I'll tell you what, towards the end of that year, it was the penultimate round at Oldham Park. I know I'm jumping in a bit too far into the year, but on about pressure, I do remember uh, the, the, we got onto the grid, onto the second race for the penultimate round at Oldham Park. And, of course, the three mini ball comes up, the tyre warmers come off, the engine starts, and then you get a pack on, pack on the back from all your pit crew. And uh, I just thought, as they walked off, how much pressure could a human being take before he goes to start racing yeah. bonkers? I mean, you know, could, could you go about life uh, when you were away from the paddock during the season? You know, when you were down the supermarket or whatever, or walking your dog, were you always sort of tempted to think about racing? Is it sort of something your head could never really escape from? Very much so, yeah. There's very little time that you do anything without thinking about what's going to happen for next weekend. You know, of course, you get back, all your gear's got to be cleaned and uh, the motor has got to be sorted out. And everything revolves about bike racing, to be honest with you. And uh, then you start planning for what you're going to be doing the next weekend and, uh, you know, what the circuit is and what the settings were and how you're going to perform, basically. And there's always the fear of failure that was the biggest problem with me. You know, it wasn't the, uh, the nerves of being scared about it. I was more scared about failure. Uh, and I mean, can can you enjoy it then all of the time, John? Or I mean, we'll, we'll come to bad days that you had that season, but can you enjoy it, or is it too serious? I mean, you know your club racing days when you just do it for fun. It's not like that anymore, is it? At top level. You know what? It was never fun for me in the first place. It was just, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to win races, and you know what? I tell you, there was one particular time I was testing. Uh, this is early on in my career. We were testing in Allery Park, and uh, it was a beautiful day, and I came out of Gerard thinking, what a fantastic job this is. You know, next minute, the bike went sideways and pitched me over the handlebars, and yeah. massive high side. And then I, I realised, I that's from there on in, you know, just that 2% of 
lack of concentration, it all goes pear shaped. So, uh, and every time I honestly, if I felt happy on a Sunday morning, I had a crap day. <laughs> yeah, I, I spoke to you. Uh probably a couple of years ago uh, I think we were talking about Rossi and you said that you envied the fact that he seemed to be able to enjoy it and be happy even at race weekend I remember remember that conversation and uh, it's a conversation I had with Neil McKenzie we all you know we were talking about that and I said wouldn't it be lovely to look back at the career and you've actually enjoyed doing it the only thing about the enjoyment was having done it not having to do it, it's just you know the, the feel that feeling of having a great weekend, you know possibly qualifying on pole, coming away with two wins, and that feeling. If you could bottle that, that, that feeling on the way home. If you could bottle that, you'd make millions. I mean, is it a bit like climbing Everest? Can you only enjoy it sort of when you get back down to the bottom almost? Absolutely, because I hate heights anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have enjoyed that one climbing Mount Everest. But yeah, that's what it is. It's, because it's such a dangerous sport, I suppose. I mean. Uh, you know, you, you just can't take your eye off the ball and you never take anything for granted. And uh, you, every time you get on a bike, you want to make it the best performance you can do. And it, danger, stress, and everything else that goes with it, it's, uh, it's hard to enjoy. And that's yeah. why I admire Rossi so much, purely because, you know, he can actually play about and look like he's having fun. I don't know whether he is or not, but I'm sure he is. And uh, that's a great thing to do. I mean, what what sort of guy were you like to be around then, John, at uh, at the race paddock? Well, one of my mechanics used to call me uh, MLB, and I'll tell you, Marty Little Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was oh no, I, I, I mean that was all right. I was I was just very focused, but always hopefully polite and pleasant, you know. And you know, you've got to appreciate that the guys you're working with want the same as what you want, and that's. That's to win races, really, and uh, you know, there's no point in falling out with anybody, is it? Even when things went wrong, I never fell out with anybody. But I mean, they fell out with me. <laughs> I mean, I, I dare say you weren't smiling and cracking jokes very often. No, no. I mean, once I got into the garage, say for the for practice or qualifying, it was shut us down, and uh, you know, just leave me alone, really. And, but yeah, people knew that working around me. They could see I wasn't much in the mood for having a, having a laugh and a joke. People were laughing and joking around. I'd, I'd tell them to calm down. <laughs> and I say, you know, when uh, you've got a massive pressure around you, you're there to, to, to do the job and you, you just want to get it done. But to be honest with you, very, very few times that I'd, I'd even think about it because the, all the teams I work with were totally professional. I'm thinking more about looking at other teams sometimes, you know, laughing and joking. And I think, how the hell can you be so jovial when there's a massive job in it, you know, in hand to do. But anyway, yeah. so a lot of people work in different ways, don't they? Yes, indeed. Indeed. That Rossi bloke seems to do quite well for being uh, jolly and happy at the race weekends. He hasn't done bad, has he? <laughs> now, 2004 was your third year with the Suzuki team, the Rizla Suzuki team. Um, yeah. How did you rate your chances at the beginning of the year? I mean, you'd finished runner-up the previous year. Did, did you think that the bike would be good enough? And, and what rivals did you expect to give you a hard time? Well, if we can go back to 2003, the year before, I thought we had a proper good chance of winning the championship that year. And uh, I'm, I'm leading into something now, so just bear with me. You know, every test we went on, we were, we were quickest over in, in Spain and then in, in the UK. Things were looking good. It came to the uh, first round in 2003 at uh, Silverstone. I went out on the Super Bowl lap and uh, ended up crashing and breaking my collarbone on the first round. So that put me to that year. And I do remember the, the start of 2004, just before I went out for qualifying, uh, Paul Denning said to me, he said, uh, don't forget, mate, he said, you can't win the championship on the first round, but you can lose it. And that's yeah. true. You know, so, uh, yeah, so it was, um, it was a start of a great year. So to answer your question, I was convinced and I knew that the bike was good enough and I think I was riding well enough. You know, we had a proper good chance of winning the championship in 2004. Did did, did you think anyone would uh, rival you and give you a hard time in particular? Yeah, there was Kian R. He wasn't there. there was Michael Rutter, he did a good job that year on the HM plant Honda. Uh, and, of course, my, my teammate, Yukio. You know, I mean, when he's on his day, he's one of the fastest riders ever. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think... 
you know, I knew there was a lot of good riders out there, but I just felt like I was as good as them, and uh, I wanted it probably more than they did. <laughs> I mean, let's just sort of uh, cover the the season. Um, you you actually led it from the first round, um, and that lead varied from. Uh, 70 up to 73 points at one stage and finished with a 90 a 29 point advantage uh, you had six race wins you had 18 rostrums and two poles now w- what were the highs and lows for you john um i mean I-, I took great interest in going through your season from a results point of view last night but and, and there are some highs, um, you know, the double at Alton, uh, and, yeah. and and you had fairly poor rounds at Croft, and uh, there's another one somewhere, was it? Uh, Cadwell, I think. Cadwell, Cadwell, it was Cadwell, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Cadwell Park, we, uh, I mean, usually on it was sketchy conditions, if I remember rightly. Uh, I think, I remember thinking as well that Michael Rutter was up for the championship as well. And we seem to spend most of our time giving each other the best possible chance to win the championship. Because <laughs> you know, so, I think Michael Woods went out on uh, wet tyres in, in the same race that Cadwater expected it to be wet, wet. But it didn't rain, it was damp and it dried out. But I was on a set of intermediates. And in those conditions, you know, normally I'm, I'm fine, you know, wet, dry, anything. Yeah. So we had a dodgy front tyre. And uh, I, I just managed to get the bike home I don't know what I think it's about ninth or tenth place, I think it was. Uh, I've got you down as uh, race two, eighth. You, you had a DNF eighth, yeah. in the first race, didn't yeah. you? Did you crash it uh, going uh, into Charlie's? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. And you know what? That crash started coming out of uh, Bond Corner. And I was chasing the two Hondas of Keo and uh, Michael Rutter. <clears throat> and I, I had a bit of a slide and lost about 15 yards to them. So I thought, oh no. So I, I sort of... Went into the bottom of, the, in fact, turn one up the hill. It's a bit quicker than I had been doing all weekend. Uh, got you. Yeah. Yep. And I tried to get the bike back to go to Charlie's one. And it went, as a shut off, I go down to third gear. But this particular time, I shut off, went to third, and it stayed in fourth. Oh. It pushed me wide. The bike was just, it wasn't pulling into the corner tight enough and uh, put me onto the grass and a uh, monumental crash there. So that was the first race. Yes, I remember that one well. But as I say, that, that crash started at Barn. <laughs> and uh, you talk, talk to me about the sort of mood in the garage after that. I mean, you know, you, previously you had your highest points advantage. You know, after Mallory, you were 73 points ahead. And then suddenly, mm-hmm. uh, actually, that's not true. It followed Croft when you had a 50 point advantage. But suddenly you're on the floor. What what sort of things go through your mind from a championship point of view there, John? Yeah, it wasn't a good weekend, actually. I remember actually reading in Motorcycle News before I got there <clears throat> that Paul Denning said that my job wasn't safe. <laughs> and, uh, Is this before Cadwell? Yeah, before Cadwell. I thought, what's all that about? You know, why, why are you saying things like that? And I'm sure he was just trying to keep me focused, but that worked the other way for me. So I went into Cadwell with a bit of a downer. Yeah. And of course, that crash was a total disaster. And then... Uh, the second race, it was, it was basically a duff tire on the on the front that didn't really work properly, and it was a, it was a, that was probably the lowest point of the year to be fair, to be fair with you. Well, well, how long does it take you to sort of recover from a bad weekend like that? I mean, are, are you chipper again on Monday morning or nothing of the sort? No, nothing of the sort. No, it takes you good, excuse me, good two or three days to get over it, and then yeah. start getting your head back together again, and then thinking about. Uh, where do you go after Cadwell? Well, I was just about to say, the perfect antidote came at Alton when you had your first double win of the season. I would imagine... Well, was that the penultimate round? Or was that it was one? penultimate round, yeah. Two yeah. wins at Alton. That's the one where I knew everything had to work out right. That was probably the highlight of the year, to be fair. Apart from winning the championship, of course. So, I mean, after Alton and that double win, you're back up to a 43-point advantage. It's, the championship's looking good. I mean, what's the drive on like then? I mean, do you, do you stop for a a, a beer? <laughs> or nothing? Is it still too <laughs> serious? I think I did go for a beer, actually, at the local pub just around the corner. Just to, uh, in fact, I did, yeah. It was uh, quite a nice day, that was. 
to be fair. Were, were you the sort of nicest, happiest, polite and greatest guy to be around then after Alton that weekend? Well, that was all right, yeah. <laughs> but you, know, you know that, that drug, that if you could bottle it, it would sell, it would, you made millions out of it. That's how I felt going home. It was yeah. just one of those elated feelings where, you know, the, the, you, you had a tough weekend, we ended up coming away with two wins and, you know, you thought, wow, that's, that's proper. And then you know for a fact that you've got a good chance of, you know, going for the championship. But um, I do remember halfway through that week, Sean Emmett phoned me up. John, he said, I can't believe it. He said, I just had the other from on the phone. He said, if, if I take you out on the first corner at Don Donington, <laughs> he said, I'll, 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 you'll buy me a brand new fire blade. And then he put the phone down, straight on the phone to, uh, to Paul Denning and said, Paul, you can't believe what I've just heard. And... Uh, <laughs> And, of course, it was a wind-up, but that's yeah. what Sean Emmett was like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, you, you spoke about the rivals that you rated before the season. Did did that sort of change uh, throughout the year? I would imagine focus must have been directed more and more towards Rutter because he was always behind you, wasn't he? Yeah, but to be fair, it was more Keo I was worried about than Michael. Yeah, yeah. But Michael had a, a proper good year that year. He was riding really well. And... Uh, you know, fair play to him for that. But he, it, it took it all away, didn't he? He, he, he? I don't know how many wins he had, but he, he rode well. But he wasn't, he wasn't, the, at the beginning, of, the beginning of the year, I didn't think he would be the man I'd be worried about too much. But it turned out he was in the end. I, I would imagine you constantly have to reassess during the course of the season. You know, you'd be making changes to the bike, maybe the way the team works, certainly your attitude towards uh, rivals. Is that true? Yeah, you know what, I've learned over the years I was racing that never underestimate anybody, you know, always, never never get complacent, always think the worst and hope for the best, if you like. That's the attitude I always had. Um, but as regards the, the bike, I mean, the bike was in a, in a ballpark configuration whereby everywhere we went with it, you know, we had data from the year before, so we sort of hit the ground running with it. You know, we had a good year, uh, a good pre-season test, everything worked good. The, the team was gelled, obviously we've been working together for three or four years and uh, it, was, it was just right, everything was right, there was nothing, you know, the bike was absolutely spot on every single weekend and all we need to do is dog tweak here and there, you know, depending on the weather conditions and whatever, but uh, that, that, well everywhere. that must have been a very good feeling then, knowing that, you know, you, you didn't have too much sort of development work to do and it wasn't going to be a challenge or too much of a challenge technically. Well, that's it. I mean, the development work was uh, done in the year before, if you like, and go three bike, and uh, it was a proper, proper good thing. But so uh, we we got it dialed in. I mean, it's different when we first when I first jumped on the Suzuki. You know, it was a mile away, but you know, working blood, sweat, and tears from uh, everybody. You know, yeah. we turned the bike into a championship winning bike. I mean, it must have been you. You were the first man to win on a thousand cc four cylinder. For cylinder bike, uh, how satisfying was that? Yeah, oh, it's brilliant coming down pit lane and seeing the pit crew there, they're going absolutely balmy. That is what it's all about, you know, make you know, everybody happy is, is a lovely feeling. And uh, they'd all worked so so hard, and you know, we'd have big problems with things breaking and stuff like that. But it was a brand new project, a brand new bike, and uh. You know, we're pushing the bike to the limits and uh, over the limits sometimes. What, 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 what yeah. sort of what what sort of things and uh, did you sort of face as challenges in those initial times on the bike, John? What needed sorting the most? You got on that GSXR thousand when it was a new bike. Yeah. We uh, I, I won the championship on a Ducati in two thousand and one. Uh, then I, was, I signed for Suzuki uh, for the start of two thousand and two. But one of the biggest problems was. It, it was very stiff to start with, and uh, lack of mid-range power. You're not just talking about the suspension there, you're talking about the chassis stiffness and the way it sort of, uh, you know, reacts. Uh, more, more of the suspension, to be fair. We tried to run it harder than we needed to. And when I first started racing it, in fact, I think the first round at Donington, I had a crash, and it wasn't a crash. It, the, the crash was caused by the aftermath of a slide. So in other words, I came out of Redgate, the bike went sideways, but then it tied itself up in knots and then slapped me over the handlebars. So it was just too hard. And then so little things like that, it was, then we started softening it off and it made it more user-friendly. 
but the biggest problem was trying to get more mid-range into the uh, to the engine. And to be fair, you know, there's a lot of time on a superbike that you use the mid-range to punch yourself out of corners. And as you well know, you know what it's like. You can't have a big hole in the in the horsepower. So that's what we did. We, uh, all the lads did anyway. I, see, the thing is, I'm not an engineer. All I do is come back and say what I feel the problem is. And then it's up to the, the good team around you to then sort out what the problem is and then make it better for you. And that's exactly what they did. I mean, did, did that take sort of half a season at least to get to your liking? It took a full season. We just started getting getting the right together towards the end of the year. We went to Home Park, uh, sorry, to Brands Arch and we won a race. And that's when we knew we'd, we'd hit on something. And, uh, you know, now it looks like we, we are going to be contenders rather than also runs. Got you. I mean, it, it's definitely a team game, this bike racing lark, isn't it? I mean, um, how how crucial is it to have a good team and to get on with them and sort of have a good relationship and rapport with each and every oh, one of them? Yeah, it's, it's massive, mate, because... Uh, you know, consistency as well. Working with the team, I, I you know, I've been uh, riding for my, you know, my best mate for the Red Bull Ducati for four or five years. I'm not being conceited here, but it was set up around me. And then, you know, we all got together as, as a family and worked together. Well, jumping with the Suzuki bunch, you know, with Paul Denning and all his crew, I didn't know them from Adam. So we had to form friendships uh, right from the word go. And you know, you're not sure exactly how it's all going to pan out, but. Uh, so when you're working with people you don't know, that's not easy for a start. You've got to get to know people. And that's why I always say, you know, when these riders swap from one team to the other year after year, it's not a good thing. You know, you, you, even if you think the bike isn't as good as what it should be, I can stick with it um, because consistency is, is, is a massive thing in the sport. And yes, getting on with your, your, your team is, is absolutely important because if, if somebody in the team that's winding you up, which I've never had, but... It wouldn't be a good feeling to go to work when you when you don't like somebody. And how well did you get on with Paul Denning then? And was Les Peterson your crew chief, or was it Pete Jennings uh, or was, someone else? Uh, a guy called Oz. He was in Aust- he was Australian. His name was Oz. Well, that's what we called him anyway. Dave, his name. He was, he was a great bloke. So you know what defines a good relationship? Do you sort of un- an understanding? Uh, you know, uh, an able an ability to sort of communicate quite freely and frankly and honestly. Yeah, you know, you've got to be able to talk honestly with your your crew chief and with the mechanics and everything, and uh, you've got to trust them as well. You know, you, you're riding a bike that they're working on, and you've. Uh, I don't know, it's just, yeah, it's trust. If, if you don't trust somebody you're working with, I, I can imagine that's going to be an absolute nightmare. You know, when, when you come in and you sit down and you liaise with them and say, this is a problem, that's a problem, and nine times out of ten, you go back out and the problem's solved. You know, that's, uh, that's a great thing to have. But uh, honestly, trust and... Uh, and understanding with your crew chief is, is vital. Did, did you sort of socialise much with them away from the race circuits? No, really. We, uh, of course, they were, they were down in Bournemouth and I was yeah. up in uh, Nottinghamshire. I'd have chose not to socialise with them, to be honest with you, yeah. purely because uh, it, it, it was a job and it wasn't yeah. something that, you know, I was, I don't know, it's just one of those things that's just how I've always, always been. I do remember socialising once. We went down to uh, to Bournemouth and it was Yukio Kagiyama's, I think, 30th birthday party. So we were, we were, all the team was invited, the pit girl, girls were there. You know, the grid girls, and we had a party. And I thought, what can I buy Yukio for his, for his 30th? So I thought, I know what I'll do. I bought him a really, really expensive bottle of whiskey. I can take that back to Japan with him. He can have a tipple every every birthday and think of me. Anyway, I presented him with this bottle of whiskey. Within 25 minutes, he down the lot. He was naked, running around the house with a German helmet on his head. We've not, I've never seen anybody go from sober to absolutely <laughs> Such a quick time. <laughs> do, do you know what my, ne- my next my next question was? What was Kagoyama like to be with? But I think you've just answered it perfectly. I mean, yeah, well, he, he shot me as well. To be honest with you, I didn't expect that at all. Was that a bit out of character for him then? Well, I thought so. I mean, I didn't really know him that well. I knew him as a as a, a teammate and a you know a, an arch rival and a, a good bloke really. But <laughs> he does enjoy a lot. Yeah, for sure. Good good guy he is. Uh, how important are teammates? Do you need a good one? Do you need to communicate with him? Or, as you've just said, is he uh, a massive rival more than anything? 
you need a good one, but you need to be able to beat them at the same time. <laughs> and uh, it does help if you do get on slightly. Um, you know, we weren't best of mates, but, you know, he wanted to beat me as much as I wanted to beat you. I do remember, I think, at Mallory Park uh, in 2004, I was leading on the last lap going into uh, um, well, the, the, old, the hairpin. And yep. Yuki had, had, had hounded me all the race long and tried to pass me. And he had a go at me on the last lap. This is when I was going for the championship. The thing is, Ooh. he thought he could win the championship as well. And uh, I remember him coming around the outside of me at, uh, at the hairpin. And I, I had to push him, push him wide, push him nearly onto the grass to stop him from overtaking me. But uh, So you can imagine when we got back to the pits, it wasn't uh, shaking hands and, you know, patting each other on the back. It was like, what the hell are you doing? F- firm words? Firm words? No, not really. There was nothing really said, but we just sort of knew. Well, I knew. I, I thought, I don't need to say anything, you know. It's, uh, and he didn't say anything, and Paul Denning was a bit hacked off with everything. <laughs> but there you go. But, yeah, I mean teammates, it's, it's always hard. I remember being a teammate of Sean Evans and to be honest with you, I, I hated him before he was my teammate. I really did and uh, I said to the boss at the time who I was riding for, I said, what are you doing? So I can't ride with him. He said, well, you're going to have to. When I started working with him, he turned out to be my best mate. He said, oh, he's a fantastic lad. Okay, he's had his problems at the moment, but uh, you know, but yeah, it just goes to show, doesn't it, if you don't know anybody properly. Um, do you change much as a person during the course of the season? I mean, when you went to the last round at Doddington, when it was looking like you could win, were you were you very careful about everything you did, you know, away from the track? And, and were you nervous going into Doddington for fear of, uh, of possibly losing things or having a, a bad result? Yeah, yeah, funny you should say that. I do remember thinking that, that there was things I was doing previously that I didn't do up until, you know, for the run-up for Donington. I spent most of those two weeks between Oldham Park and Donington um, thinking of all the things that could go wrong. You know, I had a puncture. Or yeah. Sean Emmett banjoing me off at Redgate because he's going to get a bike off, off Neil Tutsworth. You know, that sort of thing. And there's so many scenarios going through my head. And then thinking about the Chris Walker scenario when... So it's never over till it's over, you know, and... So, no, it was quite a stressful couple of weeks, to be honest with you. Um, but you, uh, you just have to get on with it. And at the end of the day, you know, you, you, I just said to myself, you know, just try and enjoy it and do what you can do and what will be will be, really. Yeah. And, and you won it after the first race at Doddington at that final round, didn't you? Had you lost the sort of raison d'etre to race to a degree in the second race because you'd well, it sealed it? Show, yeah. Just how I was, you know. If I was angry and, uh, you know, hated everything, I would, I would stand a good chance of doing well. But because I'd let my guard down, you know, the, 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 all the anger and everything had gone out of me and I was just uh, wobbling around, if you like. And I do remember, I think I was in fifth place up to the last lap and Yukio was behind me and I think uh, he needed the points more than I did. So I think I let him pass. So, so, so yes, I've lost all that... Uh, the aggression and the, the will to win because I'd already done it, if you like. Were you slightly disappointed to finish sixth then, despite the fact you were champion? Uh, yeah, I was, but then I thought, you know what, I've, I've done the job I'm here to do, and that's to put the Suzuki on the top step, you know, to win the British Superbike Championship for Rizla Suzuki, and that's what I was paid to do, and that's what we uh, we did. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, whether I finished first or last in that race, in the second race at Donington, at the end of the day, the championship was won, so that was it, really. And how did you celebrate? Oh, we had a big night. It was uh, it was quite late, and we... Uh, yeah, I remember it well. It was, well, I remember most of it. Half past 11, and then it all goes a bit blurry, doesn't it? But, uh, yeah, it was a proper, proper night, uh, as you could well imagine. And, of course, Rizzo at the time were... You know, it was, it was, it was quite a well-funded team, and they knew how to lay a party on as well. And I mean, it, it sounds as though your team very much shares in your success. Was it good to see them, you know, taking in the success of it all and enjoying it all? Oh, that's what it's all about, yeah. I mean, it's uh, if if you win a race uh, or a, a couple of races during that day, you know, the team is ecstatic and, you know, they'll do anything for you, really. Yeah. That's the way it should be. But, uh, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's just a great feeling. 
It's not such a good feeling when you have a bad day. You've got one of, one of the big crew chucking spanners around the shop because he's, he's so disappointed with your performance and stuff. But that, That's a good that's sign in a way, though, isn't it? It's a good sign. It shows he cares. It shows, uh, yeah, it shows passion, doesn't it? And that's what it's all about, passion. You've got to have passion to do the job. And you've got to want to be there. I've said before, you know, if you could run a business, obviously motorcycle racing, you don't make money out of it. It's not a, a, a saleable commodity. I mean, you, you're selling your brand. It's, it's not a money-making affair, if you like. But if all those people in that team set a company up together with the passion that they have to race a motorbike, they'll make millions. You know, it's a, it's a, it'll be a proper venture to get into. What I'm trying yeah. to say is that, you know, if you want to make something work, you've got to be passionate about it, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're having to sort of act and uh, act well beyond the call, aren't you, to win? It requires an X factor, doesn't it, to succeed in racing? Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's times and weekends where you, you, your back's against the wall and, uh, you know, you're half a second off the pace and you've got to try and find that half a second from somewhere. Well, half a second on an average lap is probably 40, 50 yards. Well, you know, you try and make 40, 50 yards upon a fast rider. It's not going to be easy, is it? So that's when, as Paul Denning said, you've just got to bite the screen and uh, and dig in. But I do remember it, uh, I think, one of the rounds at Old, no, where were we? Brands Hatch. And I was struggling that particular weekend. I was, I think, down about fourth or fifth place or something. And we went out with a qualifier on for the uh, the last 10 minutes of the qualifying session. And I came in after one lap. I said, he said, what's up? Because obviously these qualifying tires, I only do about two or three laps anyway. And uh, Paul Denny said, what's up? I said, it's raining. He said, it's mental rain. I thought, right, well, Paul's always right. So anyway, I went out. He obviously did my the first lap and then came back to spawn for flying. I stood in flat out ready to go for the flying lap. Of course, tipped into uh, um, Paddock Hill Bend, lost the front, and uh, the bar was absolutely destroyed. And got back to the pit, and he said, "What's up? What happened?" I said, "Mental <laughs> rain, Paul." <laughs> In other words, the track was wet. Yeah. Well, that's just what you're up against, you know. It's not Paul Denning was a brilliant manager, like most of the manager managers I've worked with. But uh, you know, he, he knew how to pull the buttons and press the press the buttons to get the best out of you. Uh, now, uh, another very important member, or members rather, of the team are the fans. Um, yeah. what, what sort of relationship do you have with them and how important are they? Do they give you extra horsepower? Oh, I think so, yeah. I mean, it's great that, uh, you know, like on pit lane, you've got people asking for your autograph and stuff like that. I mean, it's what dreams are made of, I suppose, isn't it? Um, and, you know, seeing so many Rizla Suzuki jackets and shirts you know, and the crowd wearing them, it gives you a massive buzz because, you know, it makes you feel like you and the team are doing something right and people want to be part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, without the fans and the stuff and, you know, and the supporters, I mean, not only we wouldn't be racing because, the, you know, it wouldn't work, but it's, it's just great that they've got a fantastic crowd base, uh, fan base. And, of course, the Rizzo Suzuki is a great brand anyway. You know, Suzuki on its own is, is good enough, but then... You had the, the Rizzler brand to it as well, and it worked really well. So, uh, of course, all the clothing was it looks really smart. Yep. And it stood out a mile. So even when you're going, you know, on the sighting lap on, on race day, you've seen so many, you know, blue shirts in the in the uh, crowd. It's it obviously they're wanting either you or your teammate to win. And, uh, yeah, it's a great buzz. You couldn't do without it. I mean, it must be great when you have a win. Uh, and they're sharing that by jumping around and uh, obviously getting as excited as you are. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no feeling like it in the world, if you can imagine. Do, do they add uh, to the pressure? No, I don't think so. I don't think they add to the pressure. I think they help you uh, cope with the pressure, I suppose. But yeah. no, there's, um, I don't think any more pressure could have been added that year. In fact, any year I was racing, pressure was on me and the pressure was all down to, as I said before, failure. The fear of it. I didn't want to fail and let everybody down. So you must be really proud of it to this day. Have you still got the trophy on the mantelpiece? I have. It's in the it's in the office. Yeah, I have. But that there's there's, there's only I think I've only got one on on this display. To be honest with you, and two reasons for that. Because one is I don't want to to have everything around the house and my lab to grow thinking that that's what you have to do to be yeah. a success. 
very few, in fact, there's no photographs. There's one photograph on the wall, but uh, that's just the way it's been. You know, the rest of the stuff's up in the loft and, uh, and hidden away, really, to be fair. But yeah, but that, as I say, that one trophy is, uh, is in my office, and I'm pretty proud of that one. Well, look, I think we can close there, John. And, and listen, can I thank you? I, I would love to talk to you again for about five hours. I, 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 as I said earlier, I, I, I really... No, man, I, I got a big buzz out of just looking at the results last night and sort of recalling some of the things that I could remember. Are you sort of glad to be out of it to some degree these days? You know what? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, I lay in, in hospital when I finished my career, and Paul Denning came over to me and he, he said, let's talk about next year. I said, Paul, I've finished. That's, that's me done now. Uh, this is the end of 2005. He said, don't make a decision yet. Just, you know, think about it. But you know what? When I, I decided, it was like a massive weight had come off my shoulders, and I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm an ex-racer now. I've retired, and that's it. And I haven't got to worry about all the stress and the drama and everything else that goes with it. And uh, yeah, it was a big weight off my shoulder. And to be fair, you know, you look at these lads now on the grid and, you know, I'll, I just know what they're going through. And it's, uh, I couldn't do it again, to be honest with you. In fact, when I look back at my career, I think, how the hell did I do that? You know, I'm just a, a kid from, from Kimberley uh, to learn to sign right and then they don't being a British champion, you know, it's, you have to pinch yourself sometimes. To be honest with you, mate, I've, I've been shaking with excitement thinking about it all again. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Just really enjoyed it, mate. Thank you. Don't worry, John. I really enjoyed it too. You just have to like John, don't you? He's focused, dedicated, professional, and so likable. Thanks again for that excellent insight, John. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe to make sure you don't miss the next Inside Line podcast. See you then.